enjoy Tornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I've got a great panel for you today on the show across the table. Familiar faces and voices, Miles Neville and Matt George. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome. And I'm pretty excited about this episode because months ago now, doesn't feel like that long ago, we did uh, 308 Winchester where we just kind of talked about the history and, and the sporting use and his military and, and law enforcement acceptance. And that episode, although the cartridge, you know, well over 60 years old now, it just resonated really well with our listeners. And it spawned, you know, to let's look at its children. Let's look at the 7 millimeter 08 and the 243 Winchester. And those episodes, they get a lot of downloads. They get a lot of comments, likes, shares, you know, all of the things you want on the internet. And so... We can't go too much further forward without talking about, in all of its glory, the 30 ot 6 the ot 6 the dirty ot 6 the, the, the wonderful cartridge that has taken everything around the world, likely, uh, and, and was such an influential cartridge in uh, the military aspect, as well as the sporting aspect. So um, I, admittedly, next to zero experience with the 30 ot 6 other than what I've done in the confines of Hornady. I didn't grow up shooting it. Obviously grew up learning about it. Uh, shot some of its children, but uh, certainly uh, a great cartridge. I just didn't have much experience with it. So do you guys have a ton of experience with the 30-06 or what's your background with the cartridge? A historian? Yeah, because I, I started off with guns generally. Um, did a little bit of hunting when I was younger, but then like high school and shortly thereafter, I got into like collecting old old stuff world war one world war two so more of a historic stuff. aspect and obviously you yeah. mentioned the hunting yeah so and i think the first deer i ever killed was with an m1 grand 30 out six that's so, i salute yeah great stuff um but yeah that's that's most of my background is picking up the surplus market in the yep early 2000s and matt i'm guessing you kind of a historian side as well mm-hmm. yep same as miles and that my my first experience with the 30 out six was was the military surplus the cmp a mm-hmm. uh, great program put together to put M1 rifles in the hands of, of inexperienced and experienced shooters and collectors. Uh, it's a great program. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of people get their, their first exposure to 30 out 6 and something like that. Yeah. Well, it's got a lot of history. And it, I'm excited to talk about it because today, I mean, if you look at our ammunition lineup, we've got a smattering of ammo, whether you know, you're shooting an M1 Grand and you vintage sniper match ammo that we have, um, or if you're hunting with it, from bullets as light as 150 grains all the way up to 220 grains. If you're hand loading, you've got bullets from 110 grains going mock Jesus all the way up to you know, 220, 30, 40, 50 grain bullets uh, if you're really into lugging some big lead out there. So before we just let this devolve into our musings about the 30 out 6, let's rewind the clocks to circa late 1890s. And where were we at as a ballistic industry or a shooting industry uh, on the sporting side and mainly on the military side, because mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the big pushback then that morphed into what became the 30 out six. Right. Yeah. You have to go back in time, 1898. Um, like most military cartridges, it's all developed on what you find your deficiencies are during wartime. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, it was the Spanish American war. Uh, we don't really touch it a lot on the Spanish-American War. It's not as you know, it doesn't have the glamour of World War One, World War Two, but very independent in the terms of the development of the 30 six. So you had uh, U.S. intervention into what was the Cuban Revolution at the time to uh, kind of end the colonial rule of Spain okay. in in Cuba and the Philippines. And as far as the United States, not a whole lot of interaction there, other than there were were interests. Uh, money-making interests in Cuba and the mm-hmm. Philippines at the time. Uh, so what you had was this big push to enter the war, get the Spanish out, and then make uh, you can you can establish whatever government you want in Cuba. Okay. So what what happened was you had the USS Maine, uh, whether it was an attack or an accident, you had the USS Maine sink in uh, in harbor in, outside of Havana. Uh, that was the causus belli that pushed the U.S. into the Spanish-American War began. Uh, the, the war for us. Uh, what we went to war with at the time was the 1894 Craig Dorgensen rifle. 
and then a smattering of the, the old trapdoor Springfield 4570. Uh, coming, you know, post-Civil War, uh, the move from black powder into, into modern or modernized cartridges using, mm-hmm. using nitrocellulose propellants. Yep, uh, cordite. Yep, we ended up with the, the, the Craig Jorgensen rifles. Uh, they're great rifles. Um, I enjoy shooting one. We have one in the lab. Uh, we load ammunition for it. Uh, but you have How this, cool is that? A, a 30 caliber bullet, 220 grains, going about 2,000 feet per second. Um, we load a lighter bullet. We do, I think it's about 196. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, can't remember. It's a 180, I think. 180, 180, yeah, 180, okay. yep, spire point. Uh, it's a good rifle. Uh, but at the time, when we're using these Craig Jorgensen rifles in a 2,000 feet per second, uh, bolt action rifle, we're going up against the Spanish, uh, uh, their military was armed at the time with the 1893 Mauser and 7x57, which is still to this day venerable cartridge it's it, yeah you still still see rifles brand new rifles made in the 7x57 yeah. well and i mean just just that quick mm-hmm. use that statement 7x57 compared to uh you know a 220 cream bullet doing 2,000 feet per second mm-hmm. i can immediately see flatter trajectory less wind drift significantly less recoil lighter round you can carry more ammunition i mean there's a lot of things going for a 7x57 platform so it was found um, you have events in, in this in this war, such as the the attack on San Juan Hill, where you have the uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, you know, assaulting this the Spanish position mm-hmm. and just getting mowed down by these seven by fifty seven rifles. And at post war, uh, you have a lot of, of research into, into what happened in these in these battles. And it was just the Americans were just outgunned. Mm-hmm. You know, we had eighteen ninety five machine guns and thirty forty Craig. We had trapdoor Springfields. We had artillery, uh, Gatling guns. Yep. but still getting mowed down by these bolt-action rifles. So based off of that, you begin development of what do we do so we're no longer outgunned? You know, what, what's everybody else using? How can we do this better? Uh, it's a good place to be is to find out, okay, yeah, systematically right. let's design something mm-hmm. that, that's not yep. going to put yep. us at a disadvantage. Yep. Time to move the, the American forces into the next century. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and quite literally into the next century. Yep. Yep. So immediately post-war, you know, early 1900s, uh, 1901, they start developing uh, this brand new cartridge. A lot of you can you can see a lot of influence on on European type cartridges, a rimless design. Yeah. Um, uh, still use the same bullet as the Krag, that same 220 grain round nose bullet, but uh, just looking at modern solutions. So they look at a Mauser style rifle. So they used uh, the the first couple models they did the the 1903 was what we we first see uh, is is heavily influenced on on the Mausers. You know the same rifles that the Spanish were using, uh, with a thirty caliber bullet. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so that bullet, although the same bullet with that new design, rimless, a little bit more efficient case shape, uh, a little bit bigger. Now you're pushing uh, that same bullet. What yeah, two, three hundred feet? Yeah, about yeah, another three hundred feet per second's worth out of it for sure. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. Now did you have to? Is that same platform, or were they pushing super long barrels, or how did that interaction go? Uh, the, the first evolution was the the thirty inch long barrels. Uh, Oof. Yeah. Far too long for, for at the time when, when cavalry was still still a big hit with, with military. So a mm-hmm. uh, big long rifle is not the best for those guys. No. So looking it up, shorting it up to about four, 24 inches. I okay. You see, you see kind of the same thing across everybody, right? Everybody mm-hmm. in the late 1800s is running 30-inch barrels, 31, 30, you know, 30 and a half. Uh, and then, yeah, right around whatever, early 1900s, everybody starts playing around with 24-inch carbines. Yeah, yeah, quote unquote yep. carbines at yeah. twenty four inches. Yeah, yeah. So this was the thirty o three. The thirty o three. Yes. Yep. And a capable cartridge, certainly an advancement, and it came to fruition. It wasn't just they played around. That was the thing that was adopted. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, they were all in on the thirty o three. They they started building the rifles. Um, Winchester even made a commercial rifle. Yep, they, they produced eighteen ninety five the lever action, mm-hmm. um, and it was one of those things. I mean, it's a, a military development. In, in cartridge technology, but immediately picked up by the commercial market. Right on. So how long did that last? Because as the name would imply, probably not very long. I'm going to guess three years. Uh, you're true. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, he is an engineer. Uh, so was it kind of an immediate thing, do you think, from the 1903, or excuse me, the, the 3003, oh, okay, this is cool, to let's try to make this a little bit faster, or what was the impetus for... Um, yeah, there was you know a few different uh, changes made to the rifle. The number one being the bayonet. Uh, mm. Teddy Roosevelt himself, being at president at the time, uh, was was uh, heavily criticized of all things the bayonet. So so he wanted to see the bayonet change. But then the next big change was was in in 1906 when they they 
they designed a whole new cartridge for the thing. Well, existing cartridge, what they did, they should shorten the case up about 70,000 so they could put in a uh, what we would think of a modern style or Spitzer type bullet. You know, yeah, that, with an actual you know, ogive. Long ogive, about a, you know, we changed from 220 grains down to 150 grains. More velocity, you get more modern propellants. Mm-hmm. Just hopefully, uh, just a chance to increase the range, the lethality of that cartridge a little bit. Yeah, well, I think it definitely did that because you went from a uh, 220 grain bullet going 22 or 2300 feet per second from the 3003 to that 150 grain bullet now doing 2700 feet per second with that initial quote unquote ball ammo load. Um, for the warfighter, the just the reduction in recoil. I can't imagine. I know a lot of those those rifles from that era were heavy and long and probably handled the recoil pretty well but just to, if you had to go to shooting with one of those things just a 220 grain bullet in general at any velocity compared to 150 grain bullet it had to be uh pretty substantial so well that's i don't know you get lost in the minutia a lot you know like if you're getting 100 foot per second either way one way or the other it's like no you know mm-hmm. no big deal but yeah when you start making 300 and 400 foot per second jumps in velocity that the, the what that does to your like point blank of you know effective range and uh, is is pretty substantial yeah just in terms of flatter flatter trajectories yeah. and getting there quicker right so you mentioned uh, the the 1903 that that iconic rifle then just rebarreled for the new 30 they did have to adjust it. there was a change in the ta- the chamber design yep. uh, the shortening of the case they had to take the existing stocks of 1903 rifles and rework them they had to pull the barrel off. Uh, cut a little bit off the the back end of the barrel, uh, reassemble, and then rechamber the rifles. Uh, so all production stopped on the uh, existing rifles. They had to re- retrofit, and then they could resume production with the new design. It's awesome. So you have the 1903 again, the iconic rifle for 30 out six, and you know now you've got this time frame where World War One's about to kick off. Was there any other major rifle or firearm developments that used the new 30 out six cartridge? Um, a lot of it was machine guns. Okay. Uh, there was not a lot of, you know, the U S army at the time did not take a whole lot of stock in machine guns. Um, mm. it really wasn't seen as important as marksmanship and yeah. it was like volley fire, that concept, mm-hmm. uh, later came into play, uh, with, you know, machine gunnery. But eventually as you, you progress through world war one, um, U S is still, uh, kind of taking a back seat. Uh, once they finally enter the war, uh, you see a lot more bigger pushes in the firearms technology in terms of, of things like machine gun and yeah. new weapons development, new rifles. Sure. Uh, yeah. At the time, the, the U.S. had the 1895, the old, the old Colt, the potato digger, uh, gets his name from the, the actuator at the, uh, the front of the gun underneath the barrel that actually cycles the action. It actually uh, vents gas out the bottom of the barrel, which actuates a little lever, which, which cycles the gun. Wow. Uh, very old uh, uh, concept of, of machine gunnery, but um, you have these European countries that are using uh, machine guns like the Hotchkiss or the Vickers, uh, much better machine guns Maxim. than what we had. The Maxims were huge. Uh, but uh, what we eventually had to do was push development of a new machine gun. So uh, naturally, John Browning was the one to step in. Color uh, me shocked. Yes, development of the uh, 1917. Thanks, John. Uh, Pretty much accepted into the U.S. government stocks a month after the U.S. entered the war in 1917. Wow. That's getting, getting after it. The Hornady Ballistics app with Fordoff is the most advanced ballistics calculator available on both app form on Android and Apple, on the Hornady website, as well as on the Hornady Kestrel. If you're interested in ballistics or do any sort of medium to long range shooting where ballistic solutions are required, the Hornady Ballistics app is free and it will give you the most accurate trajectory predictions possible. And, you know, with, when you look at uh, wars historically, uh, you see, you know, casualty rates, some of them higher than others, and you see the firearm development come along. And then when you hit World War I, there was a drastic climb in casualty rate uh, unfortunately and a corresponding drastic climb in machine guns to you know like you said u.s didn't really have a a a whole lot of quote-unquote use for them before that but then very quickly during world war one it became very evident uh that yeah that type of technology needs to be had and then you see casualty rates again climb with that which is 
like I said, unfortunate. But you then you saw, uh, I'm not mistaken, several other firearms. You know, you have M1 Grand, the 1919. Uh, yeah. Well, Enfield. even even before that, in World War One or leading up to World War One, the British had contracted Remington and Winchester to make P14 rifles, mm. uh, which was a five shot 303 British um, bolt action rifle, which is another Mauser kind of design. And then we kind of got caught with not enough 1903s to field the army that we rapidly grew to send over to World War One, and so and it, it kind of funny turn of events, we ended up producing and sending over more of what became the M1917 bolt action rifle because the rim on the 303 was a bigger diameter. You could actually fit six rounds into that rifle converted over to 30 out six. Wow. It basically took the same rifle, the P14, did a couple minor modifications, emitted some like volley sights and stuff like that, and then chambered it in 30 out six. And then we ended up, the army sent more of those over than 1903s. I think the Marine Corps was exclusively 1903s, but the army ended up using fielding a ton of 1917s. Wow. So that's always been like the um, Sergeant York story has always been like a point of contention of whether he had a 1917 or a 1903. Wow. But, um, and then, yeah, yeah. Shortly after World War One, you have the 1919. And then I think what else? Did we end up, that was pretty much, I mean, M1 Garand development in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Late 30s, mid to late 30s. Was, uh, yeah. That was a world world changer. That was a world changer leading, yeah, right into World War II, which mm -hmm. if, if, you know, historically, if you thought World War I had a lot of casualties, it was about to get a lot worse uh, on the global scale. And obviously the M1 Garand uh, is uh, like a super history rifle and there's so many collectors and there's so much, uh, there's so much I don't know, I'm going to call it nostalgia around that platform. Right. Um, and a, really a game changer in World War II for, yeah. for us. Yeah, and and a lot of people don't realize too, like the early battles that we fought, you know, like um, uh, not so much Pearl Harbor, but like Midway and some of those other early Pacific battles that, that was still largely, almost exclusively 1903s and 1903A3s that were issued there. It wasn't until 41, 42 that you start seeing the M1 Garand production catch up. So it was, yeah, I think accepted in 38, is that correct? Or mm. kind of finalized the design, yeah. you know, in the late, yeah, 38, 39. Um, and then it wasn't really until 42, 43 that you start seeing like large scale issuing of it mm -hmm. to, to troops. But yeah, it was a uh, night and day. I mean, you can imagine eight round semi-auto, you know, going against guys with a five round bolt action. You're, yeah, you definitely have a tactical advantage there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. Matt, what do you have to comment on the M1 Garand, World War II? Along with development of the M1, uh, post-World War One, we ended up with uh, the Browning Automatic Rifle. Yeah, the uh, BAR. The, the M1918. Mm -hmm. uh, too late to serve in World War One, but uh, developed up through to World War Two, and saw service World War Two up through the Korean War. Wow. You can't really talk about military history without mentioning John Browning about Every other sentence, it seemed like. <laughs> he seemed to have his foot in the door in, in <laughs> yeah. military procurement. He, yeah. He was the go-to guy, you know, um, not just the, the M1990, but he also the 50 caliber. Yeah. And, and another huge win for him. Still in service today. Yeah, absolutely. And and for good reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, as we talked about, we joke about it or talk about it here in the office. Yeah, anytime you shoot the the good old Ma Deuce, it is a mind body experience it's not just like shooting a gun i mean mm -hmm. you you experience that <laughs> but even the 1919 in mm -hmm. uh in 30 out six is, is an amazing gun to shoot just sure. it's it's much faster it's a little more exciting than an m2 you just oh, sit sure. behind an m2 and push a button and it makes a noise but a 1919 i mean you're you're looking down the sights you're, you're seeing where those rounds are landing it's, it's probably pretty lively it, it's mm -hmm. it's great and and even one of the things uh part of the m1 development was was the change in ammunition mm -hmm. um the M1 was designed with a seven millimeter, seven millimeter bullet in in, in mind. Uh, going back, it was kind of shut down by uh, the top brass. Is no, we need to make this in, in 30 out six because we have all this ammo left over from World War One. Yeah. Um, and one of the big changes in the in the ammo war, uh, around that after World War One was a heavier bullet. So they went to a you know from the 150 grain flat base bullet to a 174 grain boat tail bullet uh, in order to get, increase the range on the machine guns. Mm. Well, now you get into uh, the the M1s, and we're back at you know the 1906 spec bullet, where they they changed back to uh, what just what they had the most of. Interesting. And how did that work as we moved from World War II into the Korean War? 
uh, not too many years later. I'm guessing the 30 6 still very much in use. Mm-hmm. In terms of, of military procurement, uh, the Korean War was, was almost a copy-paste. Really? Uh, you didn't see a whole lot of change in the equipment. Uh, for the most part, you know, things like the Thompson submachine gun was, was mostly gone. Mm-hmm. Um, just a whole lot more rifles, uh, a lot more you know, M2 carbines, stuff like that. Yeah. But, but for the most part... M3 grease guns. The grease gun, yeah. Yep. It was whatever yep. you ended yep. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you ended World War II but, with, 44, 45, you had... Yep. Rolled it right in. But pretty much no advancement between the two wars. They pretty much just took what they had left over and and, and sent it to Korea. So from the Korean War uh, to Vietnam, obviously there's plenty of advancements there, but the 30-06 still seeing action in Vietnam. A lot of, well, all the sniper rifles. So you had M1D Garands that were initially issued and they weren't too popular um, with the, with the troops at that point. Um, but then there was like the 1903s and Winchester model seventies. Yeah. Let's not forget Carlos Hathcock. Yeah. yeah the Winchester Conf- model yeah. 70 yeah. Yeah. configured for sniping application that, that stuck around. Uh, and then a lot of the stuff that we kind of gave to the South Korea or South Vietnamese forces was still old stocks of stuff left over from Korea, World War II. Interesting. So still seeing action in Vietnam and, I'll put you guys on the spot. I, you know, I doubt you did any studying on this, uh, but that Winchester Model 70, one, I'm guessing a heavy barrel setup. I think it probably had an eight power unertal or a 10 power unertal. Uh, do you know what kind of bullets they were using in the sniping application? Was it that 174 with the boat tail? It would have been most likely something like the M72 match. Yeah. Mm. Oh, because they're probably be shooting at Camp Perry. Yeah, and either, and either a match load. I know I've heard, I've heard anecdotally, I don't know if this is independently verified or not but okay. like m2 m2 armor piercing was allegedly a, mm-hmm. a popular a popular choice among snipers i don't know if that carried over into vietnam or not but. okay you mentioned a match load and I, I guess i didn't think about it that way but i'm guessing there was camp perry in the 60s obviously a thing you had wimbledon you had some other you know military uh, oh for decades the, yeah. the hot item was was the palma match competition where everybody was shooting 30 out sixes right so there was available, mm-hmm. you know, match grade yep. bullets that were held to probably a little bit tighter tolerance. So that's an option. Yeah, and they would produce ammunition just for the national matches. Wow. The, the M72 match ammunition. That's which pretty is a, impressive. Which is a ball type bullet, uh, boat tail, mm-hmm. 174 grains. So looking from, you know, the late 1890s, kind of replacing the 3003, you have all of this military use. Uh, all the way up to and including Vietnam, when did the 30 uh lose its spot, I guess, if you will? Because as I understand, it was just generally replaced by the 762 by 51 right. uh, developed in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah, that had been, I think the last M1 was made in 1958. Okay. Um, out of service by 59. Wow. So you you saw some use in Vietnam, but during Vietnam, you're seeing yeah. the transition and, from... And even even then, though, you still have stuff like the National Guard. Like, I know my grandpa was in the National Guard in the 60s and was issued an M1 Garand to start off with. Mm-hmm. Um, so there okay. were still, you know, like there's that trickle-down effect. Like yeah. the, the first guys going into combat are going to get the new stuff first, and then it, it'll... So populate. safe to say by the 70s, the 30-06 had been... Uh, probably phased out for its primary use. Did they still have any machine guns, or did everything get kind of swapped over? The 1919 last lasted through the Vietnam War. Okay. You know, they used it in door guns and helicopters. They would would you know set up firing positions with it. Mm-hmm. You know before the M60 got got really big. Yeah. Um, but you also had all the the foreign aid. You'd have all these NATO countries. We were we were rearming after World War II. You're getting thirty out six. You know, you're getting thirty out six. We have all these stockpiles of M ones. We have nineteen eighteen BARs and we have an M nineteen nineteen. So you'd see, you know, the the Greeks, the Turks, the the Danes, are all are all taking on uh, M ones and and later on those guns came back through the CMP program. Wow, yep. that's pretty neat. And I appreciate you guys giving us the historical context. And I know you guys are both. Uh, very much involved in the collection of those type of firearms in the history and such an amazing cartridge again on the military side of things and it really pushed a ton of firearm advancements um, throughout its tenure of of military use and as with everything all good things must come to an end and cartridges like the 762 by 51 and and kind of the the normal infantrymen going with the 5.56 nato um, kind of ushered in a new era and War fighting tactics obviously changed where the 30 6 and rifles, with their size, probably not being the, the best option. So from the 70s forward, obviously that scape changed. Well, 
let's kind of do this same conversation only back again because yes, the 30 out six, a military cartridge, tons of history, tons of nostalgia there. So many people, you know, hold that cartridge so seriously and 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 hollowed because of that. Well, it's got an equally awesome track record as a big game cartridge. Mm-hmm. And that goes from its inception to today. You know, it's late November here in the United States. There are a lot of animals, a lot of big game animals, elk, deer, etc., getting dropped this year with the 30 out six. So in your estimation, if we go all the way back to 1906, you know, bearing in mind that Winchester did a 3003 version of, I believe, the 1895, do you think the 1906? Or excuse me, the 30 out six was available as a sporting cartridge, kind of right out of the gate. Yeah, pretty pretty soon, um, pretty rapidly. I know post World War One. This is a few years after that. But I'm sure there was commercial offerings before that, but I know like post World War One, Remington with its like leftover M1917 receivers lopped off the military rear sight bridge on the back and turned it into a sporting rifle, the Remington Model 30. They're, wow. they're like exactly the same thing. And then they changed production and continue to produce those for a few years as well. So you had an initial, like, I'm going to say. And then there. I've seen 1895 Winchesters in 30 out six that I assume are early 1900s production. Yeah. Which, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt himself uh, would have been, you know, right in that area and a early adopter of the 30 out six for uh, big game hunting. Mm-hmm. I don't have any good anecdotes of him using one, but I, one can estimate he probably used it all over north america all over the african plains yeah and i think i don't i don't know this but i think it was a little more lenient um as far as like or or easier to come by military like the new it's the same thing as today the new military hotness is like it drives a certain portion of the commercial market and then once you build up a surplus of components then you there's there's a benefit you know in there to to getting surplus military ammo or or whatever Brass. right yeah so um i imagine that that trend followed along pretty pretty closely yeah power and performance in the palm of your hand hornady handgun hunter ammunition Built around the tough copper alloy monoflex handgun bullet that features a proprietary elastomer tip, deep penetration, and high weight retention. Handgun Hunter Ammunition. As rough and rugged as the conditions and game demand. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that post-World War II, you've got 30-06 coming out of our ears. And then you've got a gentleman by the name of Joyce Hornady that just didn't get the accuracy he was looking for. He knew that the rifle and the shooter were more capable than what he was getting as far as accuracy goes. And the impetus to create a bullet that he could load founded our company. Literally, the 150 grain Spire Point bullet is what founded the company in 1949. And I, right. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I have to believe Joyce was probably shooting a lot of 30 out six, just like everybody else. Yeah. And I'm sure he was shooting other things based off the 30 out six, of course, you know, mm-hmm. 270, 25 out six, all of that. But uh, I'm sure that 150 grain spire point wasn't an accident. And that first bullet that he ever produced was purposefully for a 30 out six. Yeah. And I think in the American world, I could be wrong. You might correct me here, but like, is the 30 out six not like one of the first of the like a specifically non smokeless or i'm sorry specifically non black powder like smokeless cartridge developments at higher pressure like that standard the the 473 rims 60,000 pounds yeah it's definitely the modern era um it is, it, like like the first big wave of that i think and then i'm pretty sure 30 out six set kind of the standard long action length right mm-hmm. 3.340 is mm-hmm. is I'm pretty sure started with 30 out six. Yeah, so now we're knocking on 120 years of of that length is the standard right. long action. Right. So it really did set the standard, yeah. if you will. And I know like the Remington 721, is that the long action one? 721 and 722 are basically the predecessor to the... the modern mo- 700. The modern 700. Um, and those were 1948 things, so just post-World War II. Mm-hmm. A lot of advancement going on there for the hunter. And then just like we talked about 
in the military side of things, you know, you saw a push in firearm development with cartridge development. Now on the commercial side, you're seeing a push for cartridge, not necessarily cartridge development, but bullet technology to go along with the cartridges that were so popular for military use. So you see things like the Spire Point with the exposed lead tip that were purpose built for terminal performance uh, when you're trying to take down an elk or a deer or, you know, North American, South American, African game, you know, trying to get something more effective. And so starting in 1949 with Hornady, with our original 150 grain Spire Point, you saw a bunch of advancements just from us with technology to aid in bullet expansion, like our inner groove bullet, uh, where we sky the inside of the jacket. So there's some structural uh, fatigue areas that will Mm -hmm. aid it in expanding uniformly every single time move forward from that the inner lock which helps lock the core to the jacket a lot of advancements on the bullet side of things to go along with those popular cartridges and you know the 30-06 really founded kind of the feast if you will yeah i think i'm I'm trying to think of what else would have been even remotely as popular back in the i mean it just got yeah first first big hit for that modern rimless smokeless high pressure cartridge and yep. had had kind of the monopoly on it mm-hmm. for the longest time, probably. Pretty much the, the majority of cartridges that were any sort of competition to the 30 6 were based on the 30 6 Yeah. Yeah, and I think when you, you know, it's kind of parallel tracks here starting in the 50s. Uh, so you've got the 30 6 with its, you know, 50-year head start. And then you right. have the 762 by 51 and through 8 Winchester. And then really most cartridges for a long time were just those two cartridges, the 308 and the 30 6 Necked up or down. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't until what the sixties you start getting the magnums. Like mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. During wind mag and off the three seventy five, yeah. of course. So yeah, I don't know. It's a it's kind of a big deal. It's kind <laughs> of a big deal. You've probably heard of it. Yeah. And we talked we talked about it, but it is not just because of the nostalgia that people like it. It's the it's the it's, performance. Yeah. It's versatile. It's you ver- can yeah. yeah. Like we st- you started out saying you can go anywhere from a hundred and some grains, low hundred grain all the way up to two hundred and 30 240 250 if you want to yeah and yeah any bullet construction in between that the 30 caliber in general is is lucky in that regard that you can you know have a very short light bullet all the way up to a very very heavy long bullet and it's not incredibly obtuse to do either one of those ends yeah. and everything in between uh and then the 30 out six has the the powder column to make it happen with the whole range basically yeah Matt, you're the lead down in our ballistics lab. You see a lot of 30 6 come through the lab. I have to believe that a lot of the powder technology that we have today, the 30 6 was probably used as a measuring stick. You know, when you look at powders like IMR 4064, 4895, uh, 4350, some of those tried and true staples, um, that, that 30 6 was probably used as a measuring stick from a pressure and velocity standpoint. When we're testing our ammo, you know, in my experience in the lab, it's not very difficult to make a 30 out six machine set up, shoot well, and then run like a skin cat. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. We, we see a lot of 30 out six. We're constantly running it. Um, and, and a lot of that powder technology you're talking about is based off of those original military powders, those IMR series powders. Um, we have advanced quite a bit in, in the technology, you know, we're, we're we've modernized it a bit and, and, mm-hmm. and brought it in with new bullet technologies, the precision hunter, uh, the CX, the Superformance. But a lot of those original cartridges, the American Whitetail, those are still based on that old tech, you know, that early 1900s mm-hmm. uh, IMR 4895, 3031 type powders. Wow. Very versatile. Uh, as far as, you know, we have, we have things like the Grand Match ammunition, that, that 168 grain. Yeah. Uh, match bullet ELD. Yeah. Uh, that one is, is fine-tuned just for the M1s. Yeah, let's talk about that fine-tuning. I get that question not super often, but relatively <clears throat> often. So I'd like to hear your guys' take on... on you know, the powder selection and the, the, the a way you have to approach pressure and port pressure and, and the operating system of the M1. Uh, the M1, yeah, it, it can be a bit finicky in, in terms of, of what you use for your powder. It's uh, kind of a slippery, slippery, slippery soap, uh, kind of a knife edge type thing you got to walk along. Okay. Um, M1s do not like slow burning propellants. Uh, there's been a lot of contention. Uh, a lot of controversy on, on what, what types of powders are uh, acceptable for the M1. We have a pressure test barrel 
uh, in the downstairs lab that does have a port about an inch and a half from the muzzle that we can we can measure that port pressure. Uh, ideal port pressures on M1 are about four to eight thousand psi window, uh, no less than four thousand, no more than eight thousand to get the proper operations. You either have a, a powder that's too fast, you don't get enough uh, pressure at that port to cycle again, or you end up with a propellant that's too slow that can damage the rifle. Yeah, and when you, you're mentioning that port pressure, that's driving the the whole mm-hmm. system rearward. And what if you go with too slow and you have too much port pressure? What do you experience? Uh, you can either end up with um, you can end up with a bent operating rod, which the operating rod is already bent. It forms around the contour of the barrel mm-hmm. uh, where it connects to the bolt in the receiver. Um, you can uh, you can drive that operating rod back so fast you can send the bolt out of the back of the receiver. Well, that's a problem. That would be bad. Yes, because uh, you're right behind the receiver. Yeah, you're in a bad spot when that happens. <laughs> yep. Uh, a lot don't of, do that. Yeah, a lot of cracked receivers uh, can come uh, come about from something like that, either due to improper heat treating, you know, during pr- uh, production, or or due to just due the, the wrong propellant, uh, maybe too heavy of a bullet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's and the op rod on the M1 Garand is like two feet long. Yeah, right. And <laughs> so, so yeah, you got a lot of leverage. Yeah, you and what you're really looking at is yeah, buckling and bending that op rod. And I think that was like one of the main things they changed with the M14, right? Is shortening mm-hmm. up the op rod to make it a little more yeah, yeah, robust. Yeah, that was one of the deficiencies of the M1 that they, they really looked at the operating system of the M14 because the M14 is a, a short stroke pit, tappet type piston, but it also vents the excess pressure with the M, M1. It's, it's, it's captive it. inside yeah. that yep. cylinder. And I guess on that note too, there's a couple aftermarket adjustable like venting mm-hmm. gas cylinders yep. and stuff that you can get for the M1 Garand that mm-hmm. basically allow you to shoot whatever you want. Okay. okay. Well, that's just an important note, though. We get that question a lot, like, can I shoot regular .30-06 in my M1 Garand? And the answer is maybe, uh, but it's best, if you have one, to shoot ammo that was loaded specifically for the M1 Garand because you could have .30-06 ammo that is shooting pressure and velocity exactly in the heart of the SAMI specifications but that port pressure is wrong. You're going to run into some problems. Yeah. Is there, mm-hmm. are the lugs on the M1 kosher with modern 30 out six, like as far as chamber pressure? Yeah. Most modern military 30 out six is usually 55,000 PSI or less. Yeah. Um, and that's probably just a reliabil- reliability thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. The thing that, the thing that sucks, and I know this as an end user for purchasing ammo to shoot in an M1 Garand is, if it's not specifically labeled as such that it's okay for the M1 Garand, you don't know lot to lot what powder was used in in a particular brand and type of ammo. So you may go, you know, go buy uh, American Whitetail or Super. Well, you shouldn't probably use Superformance in a no, gas gun anyway. Not. But you might go buy American Whitetail 180 grain, right? And you get your adjustable gas system tuned in for that box that you bought. Well, the powder that was used in that box may not be the same powder that is used in the next lot, lot that you go buy six months or two years or five years later. Okay. And so you as the end user, not knowing what powder was used in each lot are kind of at a disadvantage there where you kind of have to like start back over from. Mm. from so it's advisable again, coming from an end user that shoots an M1 grand. Yeah. Do your due diligence. And right. Get the right. If you're going to use one of the adjustable gas systems, uh, buy as much of a lot as you can at one time and adjust it for that lot. And then when you switch lot, you might start over, we'll start over. or just buy stuff that's specifically for M1 Garand use. That's the, yeah. e- that's the easy button. Yep. And I've said this you know, in my technical service days, talking on the phone about, you know, shifting gears now from the M1 Garand back to just 30-06 as a sporting rifle. People would call up, oh, I'm loading the 30-06 and I'm going to, you know, I'm using it for deer, elk, or, you know, fill in the blank. And what, you know, what, what do you, what would you recommend? And in my experience with the 30 out six, if you've got a 165 grain bullet or 168 grain bullet and IMR 4350 and it doesn't shoot well, then it's not going to shoot well because that recipe just tends to just work. Um, you know, that 165 grain bullet, super capable for, for almost anything. And then we talked about it, but you've got, the you know in the continental United States, whitetail deer are target number one as far as big game goes, and in, in the numbers, and thirty out six is, I mean, it is just a standard again yeah. for for big game hunting. And I know a ton of people out west that still hunt bigger game elk, let's say, with the thirty out six, and now with you know bullet technology advanced to the point where we are, you're not undergunned. In the slightest, um, you know, there's bigger magnums, there's cooler stuff, and then there's a 30 hot six with a 180 grain bullet. No, 
know, yeah, absolutely. With the bullet selection you got today, you can you can take down whatever you want, basically. I mean, you might, I don't know. There's better stuff for dangerous game, like, for yeah, sure. Yeah, like the big the big African stuff. It, Obviously. Yeah, but then there, who was that guy that went around with the 275 Rigby or whatever, 7x57? Yeah. But, uh, but that's that's skirting it. Well, I, think, I wouldn't do that. But um, I think that's illegal in yeah. Africa now to... Yeah. to <laughs> Uh, to use uh, 30 caliber cartridges or smaller. Yeah. But yeah, short of the, the biggest stuff in the world, everything, North America, Europe, you know, whatever, you're, you're kosher. You can, you can yep. find a bullet that'll make it happen with like reliably. Right. And we talk about this a lot anecdotally on a personal level, not so much on the podcast. If you go somewhere on a destination trip and your firearm shows up, but your ammo doesn't, that kind of thing happens, man, you're going to find 30-06 everywhere yeah you really are and that's one of the the things that's you know kind of a a nicety you know if yeah oh, i shoots this ammo really well well if the ammo doesn't show up i can go to a gun shop in alaska or you know pick a country in europe or something like that and generally you'll be able to find 30-06 of some variety and that that should make a guy feel good uh mm -hmm. if you should select that cartridge um you know that's not to say that the 30-06 doesn't have its share of criticism just like anything else where it's super popular, you're going to have the people that don't like it. I've got a, a friend of mine who is a, a guide uh, at, a, a, at a pretty big operation, and every time someone comes in with a 30 out 6 and a 180-grain spire point, he shivers and, and cringes. But <laughs> that could have just been a bad taste in his mouth from an experience that he had. I don't, I don't know. But, yeah. uh, again, it is just one of those cartridges that, yeah, if you want to load something light, fast, great. If you want to sh shoot something big and heavy, you can do that too, and it's going to do everything with pretty well equal confidence, and you don't get that with very many cartridges, in my opinion. The Hornady Trek Light Lockbox XXL, constructed of an advanced impact-resistant polycarbonate featuring dual four-digit TSA locks. The Trek Light Lockbox offers heavy-duty protection at a third of the weight of steel. The included 1,500-pound rated security cable with patented cable connector maximizes cargo space for up to two full-sized handguns. The Trek Light Lockbox XXL from Hornady Security. So from a factory ammunition standpoint, you know, Hornady's really got you covered. So on our light end, we go all the way down to a 125 grain bullet. That's an SST in our custom light because 30 out 6 has got a little recoil. And uh, we go all the way up to a 180 grain bullet in our outfitter line. And that's a CX bullet. So Although that's not your typical 200 plus grain bullet, that is a really heavy hitting bullet, tons of weight retention. And for our international customer in our uh, international lines of ammo, not sold here in the U.S., we go up to a 220 grain round nose. That's quite a window. Um, is there a factory load that you guys think is, you know, if you're going to pick one, what's your favorite 30 out 6 load? The 168 M1. Yep. Fair enough. Matt? I've definitely shot a ton of those. Um, that's <laughs> definitely a favorite for my M1s. Um, another one I really enjoy is if, if your M1 will cycle it, the, the 125 SST light is sure. very pleasant to shoot in the M1. Is it? Does it, it is. It's almost com comically, uh, pleasant to shoot in, wow. in terms of the recoil reduction you get. Yeah. And for, from a hunting standpoint, if you've got, and I've, I've, uh, I've not personally done this. I had this conversation though with a customer of ours, inherited grandpa's 30-06, wants to have his son shoot deer with it but his son's a 125-pound, 15-year-old. You run that custom light. You're going to buck that recoil down significantly, 20, 30, 40% in some cases, depending on you know, what cartridge you're shooting, just by going with the custom light. And that bullet's still plenty of terminal performance mm -hmm. uh, to get the job done on, you know, a white-tailed deer or a mule deer or something like that. Right. Yeah, I think for hunting, I'm, I'm a big fan of the 178 ELDX. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've always just hand-loaded it, but I think we, we mm -hmm. have a precision hunter. We do, yeah, yeah 178. Um, so speaking of hand loading, the 30 6 lends itself to a ton of versatility. Do you guys have any go-to favorites from a bullet or a propellant standpoint that really stand out for you? Uh, 4895. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Pick pick a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> 150 to 180 grain. Yeah. Doesn't matter. That that's the one. Yeah. Good bullets and 4895 and a good barrel and. That speaks to his versatility if that's worked for you over the yeah. years. Matt, anything yeah, on I've your loaded side? Uh, a ton of 150 grain full metal jackets um, up to the 178 ELDX Varget powder. Oh, Varget, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's about the right burn speed for an M1. Okay. 
Yeah, Vargit's a good one too. Forty sixty four is another really good one. Uh, yep. Good luck with that. Mm-hmm. And that and three oh eight both. Yeah. Yeah. And co- yeah, it is kind of odd that coincidentally the same propellants tend to work really, really well in both cartridges. Obviously yeah. you can get a little slower if you're bolting you're loading up for a bolt action rifle and thirty out six you can get away with going something yeah, like 43. a forty three fifty. Yeah, exactly. And uh and get you up there with some little bit better velocity performance typically. But yeah, Vargit forty sixty four, forty eight ninety five, just kinda staples. Uh, in the 30-06 hand-loading uh, stable, if you mm-hmm. will. Awesome, guys. Well, is there anything else in the 30-06 realm that we didn't cover or we don't want to go back and cover uh, or anything you want to leave the listener with in the 30-06 podcast? Yeah, I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. I think it's it's so prevalent and in information about it. Everybody mm-hmm. knows it's Everybody knows it's Everybody good. knows it's awesome. So it's tough coming up with anything that's like it's, yeah. yeah, it's been around so interesting. long. I mean, every, <laughs> every gun company still makes one. As they well, should. Not every gun company, but the, no. everyone you know, that the, matters. The, the big ones. Yeah, you know, miles. <laughs> not every custom shop is going to turn one out for you, or yeah. at least put it in the line. But but uh, yeah, those yeah, staples, you're going to go to Sportsman's Warehouse today, mm-hmm. and you can buy a 30 out 6. Yep. yep. And uh, with any luck, it'll be the same you know, for the next 120 years as well. Because mm-hmm. although we advance, and we're always tinkering, and we're wildcatting, and I'm guilty of it. I know Miles is guilty of it. Matt, you're guilty of it. We love to play and tinker in 300 PRC and 7 PRC and all of these cool things. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the 30 out six. And I feel like we have a lot, a, a lot of uh, consumers that every time we come out with something new, they say, "Well, that's nothing my 30 out six can't do." You're probably right at at some level. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly some nuance to it that maybe they don't understand. But you can do so much with the 30 out six, so versatile. And again, for the next century and a quarter hopefully the 30 out six is just as prevalent because it deserves to be in my opinion yeah i would say i mean on the last hundred years of cartridge and powder development have been definitely improvements Mm -hmm. but they are definitely incremental like small incremental improvements and so yeah it's not like a stark night and day like so what you had available you know 30 out six with those imr propellants um yeah it's it's hard to get a drastic change with with any new cartridge that's in the same vein um mm-hmm. so yeah they're, they're they're not wrong i mean you're fighting you're you're talking minutia here right? yeah so well appreciate it guys thanks for coming on the show sharing some of the history uh sharing some of your passion about the 30-06 in you know obviously the m1 grand we talked quite a bit about uh and i like i said i appreciate your time absolutely you're welcome guys hopefully you found this episode on the 30-06 at least somewhat educational and enjoyable covering the history, its military use, and obviously its sporting application, you know, from the turn of the century with people like Teddy Roosevelt and Hemingway and Ruark using the 30-06 all the way up to present day. Hornady has something in the 30-06 line for you as a hunter. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll catch you on the next one.